drip water. Never been a shit talker, girl. I make it happen. You can call me captain when we rolling in the Tesla. Hey, fully automatic, autopilot. Yeah, girl, you got the best love. No stress, we bless. Say less, do more. I drink, we pour encore. For what they think, cause in a blink, it's all to the next. It's your peace of mind and intellect. I'm trying to protect that girl. It's magic. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were arranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add and divide and measure them, when I sitting heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became, tired and sick, Till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Tonight, I walked by Lost Lagoon. I sat on a bench and watched the ice sheet, dark and still like a quiet night. The raccoon came by, cold and shivering, its eyes begging for warmth and solace. I invited her over, opened my coat, and she tucked herself by my side. She laid her chin on my lap, and together we watched the blinking lights of the Christmas tree. And welcome everyone. We're live now in the Ruby Room online. I'd like to introduce our phenomenal guests, Phnom Begley of Nonfiction Design based in San Francisco, I believe. We have on the big screen here, uh, Andre, please pronounce your last Sobolewski. name. Sobolewski. Thank you. Andre Sobolewski of Clear Coast Consulting. And we also have with us today, uh, Xander, Xander Sin, preeminent musician and metaverse author. How are you all doing today? Awesome. Very good, That's Ken. Better. Excellent, excellent. Okay, and uh, I'll look back and forth. We're here today to discuss the concept and the theme of art, architecture, and ecology within the, the Ruby Room. This is our inaugural uh, initial uh, presentation, so I thank you all for joining us today. We're going to lead with presentations by Phnom, Andre, and, and uh, <laughs> Xander, and uh, then we'll go from there. So, uh, Phnom, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I have about 20 minutes, right? Yes. Yep. Yep, that's true. Right. All right. And I'll mute my mic here. Um, well, thank you uh, for inviting me to this inaugural event in the Ruby Room. My name is Phnom Bagley, pronounced Phnom like Phenomenon. I'm a partner and creative director at Nonfiction. Nonfiction is a design firm in san francisco um can you see the second slide with all the pictures at the bottom mm -hmm. 
Hello? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, so what we do at nonfiction is that we turn science fiction into reality, and we do that for a better future. Um, so we practice many types of disciplines, uh, hardware design, branding, space architecture, which is the architecture in uh, beyond the limits of our atmosphere, um, engineering and systems design. And so today I was asked to talk about the designing the future of everything. And to me, if I had to define how we practice that is really by merging five uh, domains uh, that, that I find very important to work together. Number one is business. I believe business enables change, right? Uh, money coming in, money coming out, resources going from one place to another, and you end up with uh, a product that makes companies healthy. Science validates magic. When I talk to scientists, neuroscientists, uh, material scientists, um, every time they tell me something new about their field, it sounds like complete science fiction. And my role is to take that and make it accessible to all of us. Technology, uh, I'm here in San Francisco, just like two steps away from Silicon Valley. We get exposed to the latest and greatest in uh, the physical and the virtual world. And so we like to integrate all of that in uh, all the projects that we work on. I believe that art triggers emotion and without emotion, we're just robots. So in all the most you know, cutting edge technology that we put out there, there's always this sensitivity um, to art. And then finally design. Design is uh, my background um, and design is here really to foster connection between all of these domains. So I'm gonna go through a few examples of the work that we've, we've done and the kind of impact that they've had. So on the left side is a statement, in bold is a statement of the types of things that we do. On the bottom left, you can see a little square, and that's um, <clears throat> what kind of um, sustainable development go goals uh, each of these projects actually satisfy. Uh, the reason why that's important to us is because um, it is a requirement actually to, um, to, to satisfy at least one of the 17 SDGs uh, to work with us. If we design something and it does not um, um, you know, qualify in, in making the world a better place or, or supporting humans or supporting innovation, we're just not interested. So this first product is uh, the first on-ear headphones without a band. Um, it is designed to be a complete extension of the body physically and also um, digitally. So the geometry of it, the way you put it on, I'm actually wearing them right now. Um, and, uh, and also the way you interact with sound, sound that's close to you uh, in your ear and sound that is uh, away from you is quite natural. We have taken all the details um, possible that make this a typical consumer electronics. You know, no straight lines, no buttons, uh, very minimal use of uh, LED lights, and really, you know, thinking about the future of electronics as an extension of the body. And in order to do that, we had to, uh, you know, work with pretty talented engineering firms um, and, and making sure that we fit all of these, you know, pretty traditional components into a completely new geometry. We work a lot in healthcare, um, and when we learn more about each disability, whether it's something that comes on with age, like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's dementia, or something that has more to do with a physical ability, um, you know, like like people who are quadriplegic or um, or or missing limbs, we um, we always think about you know how good design can actually integrate into these people's lives, right? Why should they have to spend you know, weeks getting used to a new technology when um, good, good design can actually um, uh, you know, transform bodies into, into something they can use every day? So this is the first um, FDA approved um, wearable that we designed for people suffering from essential tremors. So it's when your hands are shaking. This is slightly different from um, Parkinson's disease, 
um, because it, it may affect a different part of the brain. What it does is that it creates electrical stimulation at three points around the wrist, and it disturbs the feedback loop between the brain and the, the hand shaking. So now, instead of having all of these you know, medication and, and apparatus uh, around your house, you can actually control your hands again um, and you know, go out and have a cup of coffee, eat some food without having you know, people stare at you. You can use your phone again, you can go to work and use your uh, laptop again. So uh, really bringing normalcy to all of these people's lives is what this is about. And this is not only at, uh, with the product itself, but also all the user experience around it. You know, the way you separate the disposable band from uh, the product can be done by people with very severe tremors. Opening the packaging, every single detail was designed so they can do it themselves. So that sense of independence in people's lives is at the core of all the decisions, decisions that we make in design. Next is one of my favorite things is to turn humans into superhumans. We get to work with some of the most talented neuroscientists in the world. And, um, and you know, what you can do by stimulating certain parts of the brain sounds like complete science fiction, right? If I told you that by stimulating the top of your head, which is where your primary motor cortex is, you can actually get in a state of flow faster. You can learn movement faster, right? Athletes can benefit from that. Musicians with a lot of eye uh, finger coordinations can benefit from that. Dancers can benefit from that. And so, you know, developing this product, uh, which was very, very successful uh, when, when the company still existed, it just got acquired recently. Um, it was used by, you know, Olympians, here you see uh, the USC team for cycling using in that training. And so it's so incredibly essential for these athletes to shave off the tens or the hundreds of seconds off of their performance, because that's really the difference between a silver and a gold medal. Next, we're going to talk about saving lives faster. So by using AR technology, thermal cameras, and integrating that kind of technology in um, um, what firefighters equipment is uh, using today, um, we can actually help them um, see through smoke in real life, right? And the advantage of that is that when you are able to see the edges of ceilings and, and walls and stairs and, and the outlines of other people who may be stuck in this environment, you get to save lives faster and you get to save your own life faster, right? It's been shown that um, uh, using this technology in a you know, single family home can shave off 20 to uh, 15 to 20 seconds of the time it takes to save a family out. So, so this is not insignificant. So continuing to develop more technologies to uh, create trust between um, firefighters and the technology, as well as um, giving them the tools to do their job better. Sleep, um, you know, when we work a lot, when there's a lot of our mind, sleep is one of these things that we have to do every day that is so incredibly difficult at times. And so again, using neuroscience, we can uh, help people sleep soundly. Um, so, you know, this is a technology that um, is you know, about to, to, to be launched actually on Kickstarter uh, in a matter of days. Um, so basically it's a band that was designed to be very luxurious, covered in silk and layers of cotton, and that keeps you cool at night. And it has, uh, it integrates some um, electrodes that stimulate uh, your uh, prefrontal cortex. And that helps you essentially um, get into uh, the first stages of sleep. So what's difficult about sleep, um, especially when you, when you stay asleep, is the right brain waves happening at the right time when you go to bed, right? If you're distracted by reading an interesting book or by using your phone, it's actually very difficult for your brain to get into a state of sleep, right? And so this device actually helps you do that. So going deeper into uh, experiences, um, that transcend the physical. Here we are developing VR environments 
for um, uh, people who suffer, suffer from uh, clinical depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And we are doing this in tandem with other, um, other sensory experiences, uh, notably uh, aromatherapy, color therapy, and psychedelics. So this is done at a doctor's office, um, and um, this is all completely controlled. And the idea is really to have patients go through an hour-long uh, trip where they get to, um, you know, really look back at their own life, the past, the present, and the future, and really see hope again. Um, this has been shown so far. Uh, this, this is very at the early early days of uh, of this um, uh, this type of therapy. Um, to this has been shown to to really flip people's perspective and uh, on life and uh, and and how they see the future um, on this earth. So talking about Earth, um, let's talk about what happens beyond it. Um, all of you who are semi um, active on the news uh, know that a lot of things are happening in the space industry. So the space industry is close to my heart because I, I love space, but also I actually studied uh, in a field called space architecture, which is the uh, design and architecture of uh, dwellings and uh, crew transfer modules in microgravity and, and partial gravity. And so, you know, having studied um, a fairly traditional way of thinking about the future of space, you know, something along the lines of the International Space Station, where everything is based on function and uh, is just an accumulation of years and years and years of tools stacked on top of each other. And what I saw missing from that was the human aspect of going to space, right? Space today is made for professional astronauts who are highly trained to survive and hopefully, you know, live semi-normal life in microgravity as much as you can. Um, some people who can afford going up there right now experience it for a short amount of time between hours and days. But the future of space is accelerating towards a time where people like you and me can experience space. And we don't want to use the space the same way. We want to enjoy ourselves up there. We don't want to have to use Toilets that break after three months, you know, that's, that sounds daunting. It's in the, we don't want to, you know, eat food that, you know, really doesn't taste like anything up there. So really bringing textures and color and nature to all of these um, architectures. This, this one in particular is uh, on the subsurface of the moon. The reason why uh, subsurface architecture is interesting is because, one, the moon itself has natural substructure called lava tubes, uh, which are quite big. Um, and then two, um, there's a lot of um, danger happening at the surface, you know, micrometeorite uh, the, um, uh, warnings, um, uh, radiation um, levels that are quite dangerous for humans for long-term exposure. So when we go back to the moon and we we stay there for you know a few decades. We create this infrastructure, and people stay there, live there, um, mine, uh, or, or do scientific research on the surface. Uh, we have to think of a way to keep their um, morale and their uh, health up to opt optimal numbers, so so we can send more people in the future. So really thinking about again, you know, taking away as many straight lines as possible integrating elements of nature, even though they're not natural, right, um, is going to be very uh, essential to keeping up the health of all of these uh, workers. Related to space as well is uh, the future of food. Not only do we design, you know, electronics or whatever, we also design food. Um, so designing uh, bacon, plant-based bacon, is one of the things that we've done. You can actually buy this bacon at Whole Foods uh, today. And another thing that we've been doing a lot uh, related to space and food is thinking about what kind of systems uh, can grow food, transform food, and create pal palatable or even delicious uh, varied types of food for long-term trips, for example, to Mars. So going to Mars is going to take um, two and a half, three years for a round trip uh, because of planetary mechanics and also, you know, you got to go there and do some work. Um, and so growing some macroalgae and growing some um, um, 
uh, hydroponic um, plants uh, in microgravity uh, might be a solution for it. But really integrating different ways of mixing ingredients together, creating textures, things that are crunchy, things that are uh, unctuous, is going to um, um, you know, create variety in, in all of this. And we also explored the idea of tradition, right? Our ancestors grilled food because it made bland food taste much better. It looks better. It makes it more appetizing. So why can't we do the same thing in space? But open flame in space is not really something that anybody recommends, but we can use lasers. So that's what we did. We actually applied mm -hmm. lasers to the surface of a piece of chicken to make it look a lot more appetizing. And we tried it. It tastes actually pretty good. Um, we're also uh, in talks with a bug chef uh, who is trying to kind of like desensitize people's uh, prejudice against eating bugs. A lot of cultures all over the world already eat bugs, but for example, in the West, it's something that's either rare or frowned upon. But bugs uh, are known to be an extremely uh, sustainable protein compared to raising cattle or, or poultry. And so making it appetizing, merging it with um, all of these beautiful ingredients and preparing it in a way that you know, make your mouth water uh, is part of the work that um, uh, this gentleman is doing. Um, one more project is, uh, this one is based in Tanzania and uh, Nigeria. So in very remote uh, rural areas of these countries, access to electricity is either very uh, sparse or inexistent, right? Um, so, you know, people need electricity in, in at least in small quantity to charge up their phones because sometimes that's what they need uh, to work to charge up their, uh, their lamps so they can cook at night. Um, you know, very basic needs. But the cost of things and also, you know, uh, the use of diesel generators are not typically ideal for um, uh, ecological reasons. So um, their company called Jazza, um, based uh, here and in Canada, who is developing um, solar battery, he rented by uh, uh, and then they are rented in hubs that you can see here that are managed by uh, women. 100% of the people who manage are women. And in some of these communities, you know, once a woman hits puberty or, you know, 16, 17, they are married off. Their education stops and their outlook on life is in, essentially stopped um, or, or, or very limited. Um, so, so giving the opportunities for these ladies to uh, empower themselves with a job that pays them on commission and, you know, have them be the, um, uh, the veins of this community that is dependent on the source of energy and making the whole system as uh, green as possible is, uh, is one of the things that we do here. Um, yeah, we're designing, you know, these communities in places, we're also creating um, mindful uh, smart city. Hello? Uh, whoever's making noise, can you stop, please? Thank you. Um, and so uh, creating interconnected, uh, resilient, abundant systems. So this is an example of a school that we're currently designing for the country of Singapore. And really thinking about how we can create buildings and smart city that act like organisms. So organisms consume uh, food, um, consume energy. They poop out some, you know, material, and then everything is absorbed by another, uh, by, by an ecosystem. And so thinking about buildings and thinking about the way we educate our next generation of of humans that way is is at the core of this project. So we're still you know, in this whole thing. We already have a location in Singapore where we can um, uh, build this, this, this building and, uh, and start testing it on actual school children. So to finish this presentation, um, you know, designing is something that we have a passion for. And the second passion that we have is sharing, uh, sharing what we do and sharing how we do it. So I was a college professor for about four years, part-time, and was extremely frustrated by 
um, the, the quality of education that was given to the students at a high price. And so my partner, Martis, and myself, um, you know, cre started creating uh, this uh, video series called Future Future. Find it on, the, on YouTube. And basically, we break down all of the methodologies, all of the uh, thought leadership, and all of our views of the future in various videos. And you can see some of the titles here. So we invite you to uh, check them out. Uh, it's all written in layman's term. Um, anybody who's a designer or not a designer or a child, someone who's in business, uh, should be able to, uh, to relate to them. So thank you so much for your time today. And, uh, I can't wait to hear what uh, the other speakers have to say. Thank you, Phnom. I feel like we've traveled to the distant future and also the near future and the design that you're creating that makes things real and now is just phenomenally inspiring. So thank you very much for your presentation today. Thank you. Okay. Andre, I think you're up now. And uh, I'll meet you right as well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I had prepared a talk for the previous iteration of this gathering. And uh, the events of the past few days have kind of changed my, uh, oops, changed my, my perspective a little bit. Mm -hmm. Hold on a second. I'm going to share. Can you see this? Definitely. <laughs> Ken, can you see this? Uh, yes, I can. It's repeating the background we have here. And uh, I understand, Andre, that uh, your lineage is very closely tied to Central and Eastern Europe uh, at the moment. Yes, it is. Hold on. I'm going to, I have to go back so that I can uh, share properly. Um, okay. Okay, there we are. The, uh, the invasion of Ukraine, I could not ignore. Uh, and there is, in fact, yes, some family distantly uh, that drew from there. Um, but the reason I'm showing this is that it's a symptom of an era that we have, that I have lived through for many years, an era of incredible greed mm. and of getting what you want regardless of the consequences as much so as getting a country uh, including its people whether they like it or not and this is essentially the opposite of what i've done all my life um, professionally i'm an environmental consultant and throughout the 30 years of my professional life, I have looked at things completely differently, completely the opposite. I looked at how natural processes uh, manage to cleanse polluted waters and how we can use these processes. My the very, very first project uh, 30 years ago 31 year ago was at the Bell Copper Mine, Copper Mine in British Columbia, where we were testing a wetland that received contaminated water and removed the contaminants, purified the water, and protected the salmon that lived downstream. I've done it essentially my entire working life. And over the years, I've been teasing out along with other colleagues, the secrets of nature, if you like, uh, coming to understand the processes that cleanse contaminated ecosystems. But also during that time, I've watched in despair how the planet has deteriorated, how some of the most magnificent, magnificent species were hunted down as trophies, some of them coming near extinction. I've seen biodiversity become impoverished. I've seen how our climate is being 
pushed to to the point where our planet is near could become uninhabitable and these are the limits of that we are reaching in a system that that um, seeks out to benefit for itself regardless of consequences the consequences being the breakdown of ecosystems the breakdown of the atmosphere for the planet and over the years that's been very discouraging seeing that while i work in the other way until fairly recently it's only recently that i've seen signs of a change uh, that have been very encouraging so for instance in uh, 2019 i want to contract with a, uh, a large multinational mining company uh, i was asked to design a treatment wetland but not just any treatment wetland also a wetland that enhances biodiversity that conserves water and preserves it not just cleans it up and it's the kind of thing that I've not been asked of before. It's the kind of thing that shows a shift, a shift where mining doesn't involve simply taking things out of the earth, but actually protecting it along the way. And what it is pushing me to do in my projects is to design things differently, to start looking at systems that are engineered not strictly to cleanse polluted water, but to become ecosystems that are thriving and that embody these functions. This has pushed us to think of different ways of designing things. In this particular case, what we've had to do is start from scratch and ask ourselves, how do we design a wetland that enhances biodiversity? So we've asked ourselves, well, what do we do to promote biodiversity? And in this particular case, looking at the uh, redback hawk, we looked at the food chain that supports the redback hawk that we know can hunt in wetlands and that we know lives in that particular part of the world. And we've established food chains and we've looked at how the needs of the organisms or the plants that can support the, the food chain that results in a, in a redback hawk population that can thrive, how we can incorporate these into the designs of our wetlands. And it's caused us to design a wetland completely differently. So for example, in our analysis, we found that the hawk hunts from a perch in a tree. But wetlands don't support trees. Trees need solid ground, need to be rooted on solid ground. They can't function in a marshy area. So what we've come to realize is that our design of a wetland that supports redback hawks, that supports, that enhances biodiversity, has to be integrated into the surrounding landscape. And now we find that instead of designing wetlands that have sharp banks and are constrained within a space and that prevent access of, of for example, in here, coyote to, to get to the water, now we have to make wetlands that have very, very shallow banks that allow water to spread, that when there are periods of high flows are allowed to deposit the silts on the side and we create floodplains. And in these floodplains, we can have trees that grow. And on those trees, redback hawks can come and start hunting for animals in the, in the wetland and in, this, in the floodplain itself. And that enhances biodiversity. And what we're discovering is that the rules that we had where we would constrain a wetland within a very, very sharply defined space, which functions well for treating polluted water, 
that kind of a design does not integrate itself within the landscape. It's designed separately from the landscape. But when our goal is to enhance biodiversity, it has to be integrated within the landscape. And we're finding that the conventional rules of engineering do not work here. We have to start speaking the language of ecology. We have to start speaking a different kind of a language. And now we're starting to examine not just how we can use the language of ecology, but we also need to still use the language of engineering. And now we have to start learning a different set of rules, which marries, which brings together and finds a common ground to the language of engineering and to the language of ecology. This is a new challenge. This is something I've never done throughout the 30 years of my professional practice. And it's a little bit like Fanon was saying, there are different rules that have to be applied to make a new different products, different outcomes. In our case, wetlands that not only treat water, but that enhance biodiversity and that create a world that is much more vibrant, much more thriving than, than the one we, did, we designed before. We see that everywhere now. We see, uh, we see green cities, we see green roofs on, on, on the top of buildings. We see treed areas that are now introduced, um, not merely for shade, but for absorbing water and evaporating it, for the beauty, the aesthetic of it. We see how we're trying to green cities. We see how we're trying to bring ecology to perform functions. Uh, that previously were, were performed strict by strictly engineered uh, structures. And we're entering into this new area where there's a, a, a nearer and a closer interaction between humans and their environment. We're only just beginning to learn how to do this. But already we're finding out that this is not simply a nice new thing it's actually the way the world is going. This is a report uh, that was publicized in The Guardian by the McKinsey Global Institute. They're a standard mainstream consulting firm to governments, to industry. And what they say, this is really important here. They say the economic transformation is from an economy that did not include the cost of environmental and social damage to one that does. There will only be sustainable economy. We won't have any other kind. And a sustainable economy is one that preserves biodiversity, is one that preserves life and living things, that does not extract exploitatively all that there is and leaves a mess behind. Mm. The things that I'm doing in my work, the thing that Phnom is doing in her work, this is the future that we're coming into. This is the new way that we will be building the world. Now, what draws us to there, what allows this to happen, is not simply an acknowledgement that we are hitting the limits of, of loss of biodiversity or of the planet, of the worsening climate. There's something, yeah, something else behind it. There's something more fundamental behind it. This is what was being alluded to in the poem, uh, in the Lost Lagoon poem, or the poem about the learned astronomer, where the, where the person listening to the lecture hears all the charts, all of the presentation, and yet find these lacking, and must wander off into the, into the night and connect again with the world. It speaks to something more fundamental about us. And it is that connection with the natural world, which lies behind and animates this transformation that I'm describing. I want to present it here. I want to present it in a, in a very, very short video, actually a couple of videos, 
the quality is very poor because it's a, an old cell phone that I used to shot this from a beach uh, that was three, four years ago, four years ago. Listen to the response of people when they see orcas come out of the water. Just listen to the response of people. It's an instinctive reaction. There's this response that comes from deep within us when we connect with something potent, with something beautiful like this. And at the root of it is this inalienable connection we have with the living world. It's something we cannot do without. And it's something that we need to foster in the way that we create and we design the world. And that is the antidote to that rapacious exploitation that allows you to take whatever you like without any consequence, except for the people who live in the area. This is the kind of world that we need to move towards. And this is the future of design. Thank you. Extraordinary, thank you, Andre. Uh, I know from our previous discussions that you were beginning to integrate the incredible complexity of an ecology into the work that you have done in the past in terms of being very um, accomplished with the industrial side of things. But as you say, this consciousness is now evolving and moving towards understanding and supporting and nurturing uh, the ecology uh, to invite back a natural ecosystem, and is there a spin-off benefit in terms of the resilience of these structures as well over time? Oh, it's it, it's a completely w different way of doing things, mm. and we're not even sure exactly how it will transform things. But I can tell you the shape. It, for example, I'm I'm involved in a project. I'm advising a mining company that is trying to develop a mine in consultation with the indigenous people who live in the area. And in practice, how it actually happens is that you have a CAD operator, somebody who stands by their computer screen. And with the click of a mouse, they pick up 80 million tons of rock. They click, they bring it from one place, boom they drop it someplace else, just like that. And now that person talks with an indigenous person and say, is it okay to drop it here? And the person, the man and the woman say, no, 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 you can't do that. Because that's where the elk go when they're chased by the wolves. That's where they go for their safety. You should put it over here. That's okay to put it there. And that's a completely different way of designing a mind, mm. even though it's, you know, it's it's virtually the same thing, and yet it's completely different. We've no idea how that works, mm. but this is the future. Uh, Phenom, this leads me to think about the work that you're doing in order to improve or suggest options for life outside of the biosphere. Does this work we're performing on Earth inform your work in terms of what we can take to the stars? Uh, it actually goes both ways. Um, so when you think about what we have created to even survive as humans in the um, in in this extreme environment that space is, uh, we had to create certain things to make it work. Water filtration systems were invent invented for space first. Uh, solar panels, because mm -hmm. um, you can't go up whenever you like, right? It costs a lot of money, or used to at least. And so when, when you work in an extreme environment, whether on Earth or in space, you are forced to accelerate innovation to make everything a lot more efficient, to really think so what goes in and what comes out of these systems and to recycle as much as possible. Um, when you look at the ISS, for example, right, this, it's just like a lot of stuff everywhere on the inside. But one thing that's kind of like not very visible unless you, you read a little bit about it is that 
uh, living aboard the ISS is actually 90% um, sustainable in the sense that everything, air, water, waste is recycled up to 90%. And the rest of the 10% uh, is actually replenished um, with, uh, with a new rocket about every six months. Mm. So um, if we know how to do that in these, this extreme environment, how can we learn from that and recreate that in tomorrow's extreme environments on Earth? Mm -hmm. um, because if we live comfortably, you know, in our houses today with all the lights and all the food that we need, why would we even think about changing the way we live, right? Mm -hmm. All we want for the future is to make it better than the past. Mm -hmm. But how can we do that in a responsible way, right? Mm -hmm. Technology and the study of extreme environments can help us get there. I've listened to clubhouse rooms that talked about megastructures in space and trying to, how would we populate Mars, for example? And the common argument that comes up is, well, why should we spend money on developing life in space when we need it on Earth? And the very powerful counter argument is that the problems that need to be solved in terms of making a livable life and a sustainable life outside of the biosphere also can teach us and show us how to improve our use of resources on Earth within the biosphere. Does that sound uh, reasonable? Yeah, and uh, among other things as well, I mean, everything that's related to humans or living things is not black or white, mm -hmm. right? It's all systems have inefficiencies or have hyper efficiencies. And um, it's really the flexibility of the systems that make them powerful. And I think, you know, for a long time, we have created technology that does one thing. And if it stops doing that one thing, then it's time to throw it away. What if we thought of the life of our systems that we design, whether it's a product or an environment or a house or whatever, that continues to exist in different form, one after another, very much like things that decompose in nature, become food for something else, and then become something else for another system, right? Um, a, a lot of people, when, when we, they hear the word technology, they think of, uh, you know, circuit boards and, and screens and things like that. It's very true. That's very technology. But to me, nature is technology, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it has input. It has outputs. It, it has transformation. It impacts the environments of um, different ecosystems. Um, and, and you have to think it that way. And perhaps the future of what we call circuit board technology today is going to be closer to what looks uh, nature looks like today. That's fascinating. Um, a decade ago or more, I fell in love with a book called uh, Biomimicry by Janine Benyu, which I'm sure you must hear of. And uh, all of this brings us to Xander. Uh, Xander, you're an author of the metaverse. You're a musician, uh, a graphic designer, motion designer, and probably so much more uh, that I have not known yet, uh, just having gotten to know you. And I begin to wonder, what is your perspective on how these real world questions manifest in the metaverse? And I'm hoping that you have a presentation you can share with us today. And thank you for being patient. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, Xander? Microphone. Can't hear you. Yeah, um, Xander will come back. There's a settings on the side of the uh, Agora panel that allow him to switch microphones. So, what you're describing, Phnom, sounds to me like uh, almost a convergence with biomimicry. And I'm wondering, Andre and Phnom, what your thoughts are on when might that happen? What's happening now? Should we try, Xander? You there? Oh. Bye. Let's see. Um, there's a little setting, Xander, on the upper right-hand side of the web chat screen. If you tap that, it might allow you to select your microphone. We did hear you before, so we know it's possible, and we'll get there. Up. 
Was that you? Okay, he'll Hello. come back. So we have this really, in my mind, my mind's eye, my imagination, we have this really strange convergence and divergence of so many ideas and technologies. Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you Yes. Then. Hey, there we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> a little browser extension. Um, Always is. <laughs> Yeah. So to hop back to that question, uh, how does the, the real world implications and, and uh, the metaverse kind of merge? Is, is that essentially it? Yes. How does the real I, world I, manifest in your yeah. authoring of a metaverse? Uh, what is? Well, uh, I guess I, I guess uh, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, can to say author? I'm answering me more so the designer, uh, uh, if there is such a thing of the metaverse, but the real life implications for me recently, I, uh, I, uh, it's kind of funny, kind of embarrassing, but I've been doing uh, VR boxing on the Oculus headset, um, mm -hmm. as a, as a, one of the portals into the metaverse. And recently I was boxing and sure enough, like went outside my zone. You can, you may not be able to see it now, but I have a injury and punched a wall. And, uh, that was, uh, some real life implications, <laughs> you know, flesh and blood, <laughs> Yeah, uh, from I hear you. Movie. There's a mark on the wall over here <laughs> for much the same. I yeah. think it was Star Wars. Yeah. It wasn't boxing, but <laughs> there we are. <laughs> uh, so, so that's just um, uh, one implication. But um, the other, I guess, would uh, is 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 this entirely this theory that's kind of shaped my um, whole approach uh, to designing and in in life and everything is that uh, it's it's a parallel dimension rather than anything media or digital uh is is, is actually where you are in a, another dimension and so uh there's parallel parallels between the real world and that world um and really our interfaces you know are just uh riz Verk on his podcast said uh kind of ui you know uh that the real world is kind of like a ui interface possibly that we use to interact and so um those two things have really just uh, have really, I guess, for formulated my creative process um, for taking and blending realities and um, humanity moving to being multidimensional um, and prior to a multidimensional species as opposed to uh, primarily physical um, uh, species. And so um, my work and, and, and passion um, has really started uh, extending with the um, through the ecology of sound. Um, I, I saw I got into uh, my traditional background in marketing and presentations in Web2 through um, helping a, uh, um, a student. Actually, uh, this particular student was on the spectrum, autism spectrum, he was nonverbal. And um, uh, this is my first job out of grad school, but and uh, the, working with this kid, you know, I learned a lot. He um, had this this machine he used to speak, and he could say things like "yes" or "no," um, "I love you." He even said that to me one time. So he's got a special place in my heart, and uh, pretty funny. He used to like say cuss words and like, "Can we cuss on here?" I don't know. He said like "ass" and things like that, just like basic cuss words that aren't really cuss words. I thought it was hilarious. So uh, I noticed during summers he had a a hard time um, with mobility. Uh, you know, being it's hot outside and this machine he used to communicate had, had a strap around his neck that, you know, would be uncomfortable and just trying to run around and play as, as little kids do, it could, it could um, cause some problems with mobility. So he had the choice to leave it on so he could communicate or take it off and thus he wouldn't really have his voice anymore. Um, so uh, long story short, this led me to look to try to find something in lieu of that device that he had um, that could allow him to communicate like a piece of software, basically software, hardware. Um, and, uh, you know, the other the other children at the school actually weren't as lucky as him. This, this machine was kind of expensive and they didn't have anything. They were communicating with uh, flashcards or uh, kind of rudimentary things like that. Um, so luckily enough, we found this grant uh, for the software. We got this grant for the software and then they adopted it. And now all the kids can use anything from like an old iPod touch to a, a smartphone, any device to really have a lot more sophisticated communication. 
and um, that quest to help um, help someone find their voice and just communicate more deeply gave me a, a deep love for technology um, and the creative application of technology uh, to solve real life problems. And so I did that for a number of years. And uh, when I was at an interesting career point, a few years ago, I uh, came across a TEDx talk uh, by Hannah Hodger uh, about sound and um, uh, radio astrology. And uh, long story short, I discovered the even the universe has a voice. You know, when we think of space, a lot of times we don't think of the auditory things, but we actually have explored more of space through sound waves and auditory than we have visually. Um, so this kind of um, Im implementation of the ecology of sound and us being able to explore through those aspects led me to really integrate that deeply into my work. Um, uh, into into tech companies as well as in the Web3 space and metaverse ecosystems. Uh, I really, really lean heavily on the sound um, quality aspect and technology to drive the visual component uh, whenever I get to collaborate with brands, um, using those as mediums for storytelling in the natural ecology of, you know, building dimensional um, experiences. Yeah, <laughs> I could so listen I, to you uh, talk for another hour about this. As well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank when, you. When it comes to your your artwork and your music, uh, do these methods of communication begin to inform uh, your art? Definitely, you know, definitely. Um, increasingly, I have this this um, hope for humanity of um, being able to create um, at the speed of thought. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of our biggest struggles in, uh, that we are on right now is kind of taking and conceptualizing what's in our imaginations and bringing it into another realm. And I imagine and um, yearn for the time when we can, you know, remove that friction and just, you know, at the speed of thought, create and share with other people, uh, and incorporate their ideas um, into a, into a, a, a much more rapid ecosystem. So, um, whenever I am creating, that's usually at the uh, you know the genesis of my creating process. I'm trying to express some um, some base level emotion that um, uh, or feeling or um, story that I think could resonate. Uh, kind of part of the collective consciousness that can resonate on the most base level and um, that I'm experiencing that I can share with other people. And um, then the same thing, you know, really uh, one of my the things I'm most passionate about now is, is listening uh, with all these new technology and the wealth of, you know, clients and um, who are experts in their fields that I get to work with. I um, kind of like you were saying, kind of, I love listening and then asking questions. And that just um, is, is almost like an imagination exercise for me um, uh, in, 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 in imagining solutions um, uh, to, the, to the posed problems and uh, creating pathways through collaboration with other experts uh, that ex expand my view of uh, not only the universe, but just uh, possibilities, um, even in creation. Um, there's this one really exciting NF NFT project um, coming. This is, sorry, not not trying to shill, but it, it's just also real, of a, uh, a, a designer we've partnered with, and she's blind. And uh, this technology studio partnered with her to create a, a dress uh, that came from her imagination um, and uh, uh, Mr. Metaverse, you know, a good friend of mine, Teddy, had, had, a, had a saying, he said, you know, the Metaverse is, uh, has an ability to make the unseen visible. And, um, you know, so I'm just, I'm just ecstatic about that. those kind of moments of being able to, you know, again, uh, jump beyond the boundaries of of uh of imagination and um of my own imagination limitations of my own imagination collaborate with others and um just the synergy that arises from that um kind of uh medici effect of of, mm -hmm. of collaborating you know is uh is very exciting it sounds like you describe um kind of a resonance wave that can occur between two people collaborating or discussing an idea uh which in itself 
forms reality or forms an impression of reality uh, in the metaverse, a digital reality in the real world um, with the leg time, a manifestation in a physical good or an ecological restoration or a device that can help improve life. Um, you talk a lot about uh, communication, kind of trying to reach beyond barriers of communication and imagination. So what would that impl implicate in terms of, or suggest in terms of a soul in uh, this expanding digital world we're in the process of inventing? Yeah, uh, that's really interesting. Um, I think maybe just, uh, <clears throat> you know, as uh, I think consciousness is expanding um, or, or rather expression of consciousness is, is ever expanding. So I think they're, uh, you know, so the more it's kind of like you know, shooting a uh, shooting an arrow into the depths of space and imagining as far as you can go, mm -hmm. and then imagining ten times beyond that. You know, and and there's still unlimited space that you can go, but it's mm -hmm. just the exercise of stretching uh, what's possible. Um, I think uh, just is, is 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 good. I can't get too scientific with uh, the my belief why, but that's just that that kind of uh, reoccurring rediscovery um, that just continues to happen um through whatever the medium whatever the you know the subject um but that creation of that genesis um and in and, and shared energy that that happens is um i mean it's just it's i think it's why we're seeing such rapid adaption uh you know it expands your own um i um your own identity you know of what's possible your your own belief of what's possible and uh, that drives action. You know, we humans have a consistency to remain consistent with our self identity. So, you know, when we expand that, now, you know, um, I am an NFT holder or I am in web, the Web3 space. Um, I think when those things become part of our identity through like uh, digital fashion or uh, in NFT ownership, you know, that experience of now this is a part of the things that I own, a part of my identity. Uh, I think that drives a lot of, of behavior change, you know, and mm -hmm. adapting new language. Uh, uh, wag me, is it right? As I, yeah. as I said, with NFTs, NFTs speak. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's all, uh, it's very exciting. It is interesting uh, when you describe it, it's almost like we're looking from the inside of ourselves out into the real mm -hmm. world. The metaverse, we're creating avatars. So we're looking at ourselves into another version of herself and then looking from the avatar into a virtual world. And so where does it end? Uh, but now, <laughs> uh, you focused very successfully on creating real world items that help to improve life. And we're discussing very esoteric ideas at the moment here. Um, are there moments of connection between the work that you do to improve life in a very real sense and foster these kind of more, um, uh, ephemeral or more difficult to define aspects of being a human being? Uh, I don't think they can ever be separated. Uh, if you design for humans, you have to integrate all of this. Right? When you do user research, when you try to extract insights in behaviors, um, you can't make the assumption that everybody is going to act the same way all the time. I'm going to give you an example. I, we're designing this device um, for people suffering from rheumatoid arthritis, and it's it's real pain, right? All day, all night pain. And um, one thing that we realized is that people who were better testing this product would rather be in pain than plug in a USB-C cable every night. Like these are the kind of thing that that blows my mind. Um, and you know, no research out there that I've seen tells you these type of thing. You have to test on people. You really have to adapt to the illogical behaviors, if you want to call it that, mm. of humans because they're humans, mm. right? Um, yeah. That uh, goes very close to home because I have family members who suffer from rheumatoid arthritis on top of being a generation that was just getting vaccinated with polio at the time. So this does very much shape the possibilities in their life. And they have to find ways to live that life from the inside out um, mm -hmm. in a way that fulfills them, um, but also reduces 
the weight of daily life, the things that they need to do every day to, to get through. So uh, what you're doing, I think, especially with, say, trying to steady hands, that technology, trying to promote good sleep um, is the way forward. To me, this is like Star Trek level considerations and innovations now. And I, for one, uh, given my family members, are very grateful that you're doing this. And I was very excited to talk to with you today. Um, Andre, with the work that you're doing, you're in connection with um, original peoples, Aboriginal communities. And although my knowledge is not so great of these communities, there's often a suggestion of an internal life or a spiritual life that helps guide life in the real world. And with you, these things are connecting with real world solutions to improve ecosystems, uh, to purify water. So what is your perspective on this connection of the spiritual as it relates to this developing um, metaverse environmental domain? It's difficult to, it's difficult to say because um, our own culture has desiccated any sense of a spiritual life. It has rendered anything and everything meaningful to only to those things which are material, to the things that we can hold, that we can see. Um, and that's not the case for other cultures, certainly not for indigenous people, first people in various parts of the world. And I think that's a difference that we need to reconcile and that we can learn from. Um, I'll tell you of an anecdote that uh, speaks to this. I was in Peru in, uh, in the high Andes at uh, Minera Antamina. And I was looking for wetland vegetation. And we would hike up some ridge and go down another ridge and then come to a small village. And the campesino would say, oh, go over there. I'm sure you will find what you're looking for there. And, uh, and as we're walking up the top of one ridge, one of the person who was with us, I talk with him and he says, you see the mountains over there? These mountains are alive. They are alive. And I let go of any preconception and I just looked at the mountains and I could see what he was saying. And I could agree with what that person was saying, even though it spoke completely differently from anything I know and I relate with. At that moment, I could, I could agree with that. And what Xander is saying about the metaverse, that may be a place where something like that develops. I'm not sure. That may be a place where the metaverse is a place with no boundaries. And we may discover things that are outside of the boundaries that we've, ex that we've produced here within our lives. One such boundary being anything that's meaningful is only the stuff you can touch, hmm. that you can hold in your hand. I'm not sure, but that would be a shift. Hmm. I've come to wonder if the metaverse will be something similar to a reflecting pool or a divination pool where we explore ideas, we develop communities, we create without the limitations of gravity or uh, engineering, uh, things that our lives depend on in the real world. And I wonder to all of you, is there a possibility that activity in the metaverse could then somehow manifest with pe pe through people's actions in the real world? Uh, your thoughts on a very esoteric idea. 
Well, I can, I can tell you one thing. Sorry to jump in like this. <laughs> um, it, it's leading to a change in behavior. Um, so when you have online dating, for instance, you can meet somebody, fall in love, and three days later, they ghost you. And you completely disappear. And that kind of behavior did not exist before. We can instantly form a bond, solid as could be. And two days later, you completely disappear, you vanish. Mm -hmm. um, it, it speaks to an unbounded behavior that previously was bounded and constrained by social norms. Mm -hmm. and, and that is gone. And I remember, I remember, I mean, I'm older than you folks. <laughs> uh, I remember 20 years ago when the internet was beginning, or 25 years ago, we had the same conversations, absolutely the same. The internet as a force for good, etc. And what I've learned over the next 25 years is that the limitations that exist on it are the limitations of the human soul, of, of human development. We are as good or as bad as we are as human beings, mm. as vain and as greedy and as beautiful and loving as any human being can be. That's what I've learned about that. When you say this, it suggests to me almost where some argue Western world begin, which is where I'm most familiar with it. The idea of people as legends, the idea of these things you describe being projected into stories. Uh, into legend, into myth, as ways to understand ourselves. Uh, Phnom, what's your point of view on this this particular kind of madness we're experiencing now <laughs> with the metaverse? It's funny because uh, I mean the metaverse seems to be a new concept, um, you know, to the average person out there. But when imagination is part of your life and part of your work, and it has always been. Um, you know, thinking outside the bounds of societal norms or the laws of gravity or anything like this is, is actually quite natural to us creatives. Um, and so I cannot wait to create things that even have names for today. Um, and part of those things are going to be jobs, right? Positions, feelings states of being, uh, connections. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful and somewhat delusional about uh, the fact that people are going to find a way to make it work for themselves, right? Uh, whether it's good, bad, anything in between. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I, I cannot wait for that world to develop. I cannot wait for it to influence the way we live in the quote unquote real world and vice versa. Um, but one thing that I really wish it does is um, for, for people in society to stop thinking that they have to live in the bounds of dead people. Like a lot of the rules that we put ourselves through, the, the average person, you know, you have to do this by this age. You have to know this if you go to whatever school. You have to, you know, buy a house, have a pick, white picket fence, and own a dog. You know, all, all all those things. What do you actually have to do? What do you actually have to consume? What do you actually have to be in order to experience joy? I think I think you know. Ha, ex having people experience that uh, kind of like almost midlife crisis, quarter life crisis, whatever life crisis um, is so incredibly important. Um, everybody who is quote unquote successful and is, is in, um, in control of what they're doing and how they're doing it have probably been through that crisis themselves. Wow. Why am I doing with my life? Why, why, why do I have to do the same thing as I'm told, right? Um, but at the same time, there's a responsibility about it. And responsibility is not a static thing. 
right? It changes on culture, time, uh, space, uh, virtual uh, versus physical. There are certain morals that we abide to, right? Killing a person today versus killing a person 500 years ago were very different things. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and what does that mean and how does the presence and the use of a metaverse or metaverses is, is going to do to us? I wonder, and this may be reaching, but I wonder if the, a possible outcome of these metaverses and the designing of them and the wild rampant creativity that's involved, which is also connecting with um, financial aspects, with marketing, um, with not only identity and discovering one's identity, but also meeting like-minded individuals. So we're seeing various groups come under um, new attack, uh, say in the States for political motivation. And other groups have lived with this for hundreds of years. So in the metaverse, we get to find our kin. We can establish our, our own groups. We can develop our tribes and our stories and our environments and express our art in a very literal way. Um, and what you'd mentioned, Xander, about communicating with this autistic individual through the device uh, was illuminating to me because there's the possibility that genius is everywhere but it's not known because either there are problems communicating or phenomenas you've mentioned access to technology um, or even electricity to be able to use such devices. Uh, so Xander, what are your thoughts on what the metaverse could be in terms of the beginnings of a new idea of civilization? That makes sense. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just so grateful sitting here amongst these amazing minds and um, being caught listening. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for sharing that guys. Um, to kind of build off of, uh, of, of what my other co guests here have said. Um, uh, one of my, one of my kind of all my mentors has a saying, uh, Tony Robbins, he says, uh, you know, um, fulfillment is a science, excuse me, uh, Achievement is a science, but fulfillment is an art form. So I think, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, financial incentive as, as this increases. And uh, I think it will free up humanity to, to uh, just have a lot more time to gamify their lives mm -hmm. um, as you know, pay to earn and kind of gamification uh, blends with reality. Um, and uh, there will be some um, people who, you know, are against that but just traditionally as we've gone along i think it's it's okay for humans to lives to become more easy uh i think it was kathy hack who may have had had a point to this uh the gamification of the future um but when we can have technology improving our lives and taking care of some repetitive or dangerous tasks we'll have more time to just explore uh i guess our humanity or expression of uh, of consciousness and uh, I think that's where the uh, fulfillment comes in. You know, it's different from everyone. Uh, what 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 is important to me, um, you know, um, adventure or uh, uncertainty. I have to know. You know, I have to know in my life there's going to be exciting things. Mm -hmm. it may not be what works for you. But you need certainty in your life. Um, so I think uh, we'll have new ways of expressing uh, expressing our, our base level needs. Um, in new, new and exciting ways. You know, maybe before, like I was saying earlier, I couldn't really be a a, 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 a fighter or a boxer, um, <laughs> you know, because uh, A, I don't get punched in the head, and, uh, you know, B, maybe because of the training that has to take place, you know, I don't... Uh, I've had uh, similar thoughts when considering a, a possible other life as a Jedi, but uh, that's a little yeah, bit out of reach. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> even better, yeah, maybe, you know... Uh, but that, that excites me, that ability to be able to have these new expressions and uh, just ex express ourselves in new ways. Maybe I can go cliff jumping five days a week with my friends from Australia, you know, um, or splunking or something like that. So I think that uh, those aspects are exciting. You know, there are the moral obligations that, that come um and I don't want to pay too of, of a, this euphoric picture of the metaverse because uh, there's a lot of work with regulations and mm -hmm. uh, safety that need to be done as well. But um, yeah, those those two aspects of just uh, uh, furthering the experience, you know, both fulfillment and achievement. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, brilliant. 
Well said, thank you. Um, as you discuss this, uh, my mind turns to you, Andre, and thinking about um, how, let me posit a situation. Um, I myself grew up in a city, uh, but I have an affinity for uh, the countryside, for nature, uh, for the layered and encapsulated degrees of complexity within nature. So as close to ecology as you are, uh, both in engineering and in knowledge, how do you begin to connect with uh, a generation or group of people that may be pure city dwellers? How do you bring what you experience and have developed a close kinship with to people who may not have the initial vocabulary uh, in a way to understand or connect with that? I think it's there, it's latent. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the point of the Orca video, mm -hmm. is that it's an instinctive response that I've always seen, always seen. Um, it needs to find a way to being expressed. And perhaps greening of cities, perhaps... Uh, um, I, re I recall being in a lounge uh, in a hotel that had a green wall. Uh, hmm. And we just sat there and met with some people, had some drinks. But the effect of being under that green wall with, with, with luxuriant vegetation was extraordinary. It felt completely different from a normal cement wall, if you like, <laughs> uh, decorated however you like. Mm -hmm. um, I think that transformation can be brought into the city and can have a very positive effect. I don't think it's adequate by itself, but it's a place to start. Mm. Um, we build that in, in I, can't, I can't think, I can't think with more degree, uh, more with, with more detail. I do want to say one thing though, mm. is, and it's to, with both Zender was saying and Phnom was saying, it's that interactions aren't purely consumables, if you like, they can be transformative. We can be transformed by extraordinary music, by extraordinary poetry, by, by extraordinary experiences that we have. That is the possibility that exists in what we're talking about. And it can also, in what in the question that you are asking me, it is implicit in in that question. Can I be transformed to share and to care for more greatly uh, with the natural world? By can I be influenced by it and and, and be transformed into into liking and wanting it more, mm -hmm. and then begin to change the world around me, to make it more green, to make it more vibrant, uh, to make it perhaps more spiritually in, imbued. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is the possibility that, that arises from all what we're describing here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's open-ended. And as you describe the greening of the cities, I begin to think about uh, various species which may arrive unnoticed uh, to take up habitation in uh, these sorts of environments, and then gradually would attract other um, animals. Um, I guess I'm thinking of a hummingbird that appeared outside my window here, and uh, thinking about how I can provide it with uh, a bit of sustenance, particularly during our cold snaps. So in the scenario, you're- And then, and then suddenly you start caring for that hummingbird. Exactly, something opens up. In, uh, you in respond mind. from the heart. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, Phnom, you're working with technologies uh, that are meant to work in concert with meditation, if I understand properly, and psychedelics and so on, using color and light and perhaps sound. Um, do you see that perhaps as a pathway to uh, the soul and the betterment of uh, civilizations over time? <laughs> I know I'm reaching a little bit. My apology. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, think about the things we've done for generations and generations, rituals, traditions, 
um, the things that we collect, the things that we pass down from generation to generation, the things that we touch, smell, and eat. Um, you know, this, these are all multisensory experiences. You know, a religious experience is a multisensory experience, right? Um, you don't necessarily have words to describe what it is, but you know it is there, and you know it is true, and you know it means something to you. And I think once you have a grasp of what these senses that you are given as bodies and as mind and as souls, um, and if you know how to use them, and you trust that these things that are hitting your body, these colors, these textures, these smells, these um, things going through your veins, um, and 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 kind of like surrender. I think the act of surrendering to 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 the experience is 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 a first step that gets you to another place. Whether it's a place of meditation, a place of calm, a place of uh, sometimes it can be negative too, like a place of stress uh, with PTSD, for example, um, where you know we 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 need to give language to all of that, mm -hmm. or we need to not give language to all that. You need to be okay with experiencing things that are new to you, right? If you fear all new experiences, it's going to be very hard for you to even want to try new ones. So a, a mix of experiencing new things and also feeling the comfort of familiar things like in traditions mm -hmm. is, is really what makes us human, mm -hmm. right? Whether you, we are living by ourselves in our small dwellings or we're living in communities where we can count on others when something goes bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I absolutely agree. And uh, certainly we're living in times that uh, suggest uh, the importance of that kind of resilient connection. And as you describe it, my mind is casting back to uh, my, my days of yore in Halifax, Nova Scotia and our kitchen parties, which in itself were a ritual. You know, Parties were rarely held in the living room. They're always out on the veranda, outside or in the kitchen. So rituals matter. Um, I want to thank you all for your time participating in this, this mad experiment. And I'd like to ask uh, that we go around the table uh, for any closing statements and ideas you'd like to share uh, with everyone, both in the real world and the metaverse. Uh, um, yeah, in both the real world and the metaverse, always find happiness, whatever happiness means to you, right? If happiness is within you, then find that. If happiness is giving, then give. Mm -hmm. If happiness is thinking about others, thinking about the planet, thinking about future generation, then do that. Um, if we are not happy, we cannot think and we cannot do anything. Um, so start with that. Fantastic. Yeah, Andre. It's much along the same lines in a way, uh, but from a different viewpoint. Um, we can surf over all of life and consume it all and never contribute to it. But in that way, we will never express ourselves. And without expressing ourselves, we cannot know ourselves. And I think what Phenomen is saying about finding happiness, a part of it comes from knowing ourselves, knowing who we are, what we stand for, what we believe, our, the things that we're good at, our limitations, and it exists when we manifest it. Manifested in song, manifested in the work we do, manifested in the way we care for our children, how we love them. And when we do that, we come to know ourselves. Then we can contribute with our own voice, with our own style, with our own originality. And if we create a world like this, that upholds and welcomes the voices of everyone so that they can speak their own, with their own voice and contribute their own originality, 
then we make a rich and vibrant world. Very well said. Very well said. Hey, Xander, uh, any parting thoughts? It, it, yeah, definitely. It's so beautiful. Um, everything you guys just said. Uh, I suppose the only thing I would add to that, um, um, you know, try to contribute a bit is just a reminder that, you know, in both the real world and in the metaverse, um, my hope is that we find ways to remember we are not alone. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest lies that, you know, causes us, uh, so many people to kill themselves. Um, and it's just feeling, you know, isolated and that's not at all true, you know, and, and through, um, you know, finding and connecting to your community, um, I hope, uh, through the web three or just in real life, I hope that people are reminded that if it hasn't happened yet, you know, it may happen for you. Um, like literally in the last year, I'm 33 and this is the first time I feel I've really been able to connect to community. Uh, it's been a life changing experience. Um, for me, uh, it's come through web three. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something I've always longed for. I've always felt like an outsider, always felt, you know, <laughs> even, even when I've been accepted. So my hope is that others find, um, find that community that inspires you to, um, contribute your, the best of your talents and, um, and just celebrate and contribute. And that makes you feel so alive. Beautifully said, beautifully said. Uh, it's clear I'm in very good company uh, with this session today. And I want to thank you all from the center of my heart for sharing your time and your ideas uh, in this particular uh, crazy experiment. And um, from here, I'll play a video uh, of the piano concert in the Ruby Room. Um, I'll try and fire up the Ruby Room in the background. And if it works, we'll go from there. But uh, we can continue uh, speaking afterwards uh, in private. And uh, thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank,
drip, drip water. Never been a shit talker, girl. I make it happen. You can call me captain when we rolling in the Tesla. Hey, fully automatic, autopilot. Yeah, girl, you got the best love. No stress, we bless. Say less, do more. I drink, we pour encore. For what they think, cause in a blink, it's on to the next. It's your peace of mind and intellect I'm trying to protect. Let go. It's magic. Go.